everyone welcome we're wondering if you folks could please start typing away in the chat let us know where you're dialing in from we have a number of hbs and harvard clubs who are participating and partnering on the session with us it will be great to hear you folks through the chat uh, we have atlanta we have australia we have winnipeg we norway new york people are dialing in over a phone line fantastic los angeles milan kuwait pittsburgh madrid orange county excellent germany long beach uh, charlotte jakarta we are spanning the whole globe here minneapolis dubai new hampshire wow outstanding so uh lo lots of places i think uh i saw one winnipeg that is colder than toronto right now and lots of places where people are very fortunate to have such nice and warm weather like istanbul uh during this during the, these winter months that's great please keep it going will be fantastic to see and hear who's on the session and also where people are joining from. I'm delighted that uh, in this session, uh, we're doing it uh, together right now with Anthony Scalero, who is the head of finance at Lending Loop and LoopCard. Uh, he's also the member of the board of directors of Strides Toronto, and Anthony is the CFO of the HBS Club of Toronto. Also, he's a fellow a graduate of the PLD program. He's a PLD alumnus. And it is delightful for both Anthony and I to welcome Professor Tushman, as Professor Tushman is the Baker Foundation professor, an MBA class of 1942 Professor Emeritus, and Charles Thornton Chair of the Advanced Management Program at Harvard Business School. Uh, prior to that, Mike was the chair of the PLD program that uh, Anthony and I finished. And uh, for me personally, uh, I'm immensely grateful to Mike for all of the teachings, for all of the learnings I've received from him. And uh, he is squarely uh, on my personal list of top 50 people where I had to create this list at some point of people who most significantly and positively impacted my life. Uh, so Mike, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to have you with us. You have many fantastic uh, accolades and research that you have contributed to the world and to our community. Uh, Mike uh, was awarded the Academy of Management's Career Achievement Award for distinguished scholarly contributions to management. Uh, his publications include Lead and Disrupt, uh, and the second edition was uh, issued and published in September 2021. And then also a book called Winning Through Innovation, uh, a practical guide to leading organizational review and change with Professor Charles O'Reilly and many others. Uh, How CEOs, top teams and boards steer transformation, navigating change, competing by design, uh, managing strategic innovation. By all accounts, uh, Mike is one of the leading uh, the leading uh, researchers, uh, educators, uh, and consultants uh, in the world in terms of leadership innovation. Uh, Mike is a co-founder and director of Change Logic, a consultancy that he co-created and is internationally recognized for his work on the relations between technological change, executive leadership, and organizational design. Mike, we're, we're grateful to have you with us. Uh, welcome. Well, Boris, uh, thank you for that like amazing introduction. Uh, Anthony, thank you for helping making this happen. And I'm so thrilled to see uh, so many uh, friends and colleagues uh, from around the world um, uh, in this session and, and for people who I don't know. So I'm just thrilled to be with this Harvard Business School community, uh, AMP, PLD, GMP, MBAs, uh, uh, and friends of the Harvard Business School. So I'm psyched for this session. Thank you, Mike. It's great for us to have you here and jumping immediately uh, into questions. Wanted to uh, see that for the for the benefit of folks who are exploring some of, some of your works, folks who will be looking into Corporate Explorer, the book that you've co-authored that just came out. The central question of your research is how firms manage strategic transitions from one business model to the next. What makes this question interesting to you personally? How did you get involved in this great. question? Great, great, Boris, thank you. And everybody who's on this, um, the more interaction through chat, and I may well be cold calling people, 
because I see everyone's names, the more interaction, the better. So we're going to engage in question and answer. The more you guys get involved, uh, the better. Yeah, so Boris, that's a super question. I have been studying essentially one thing for my whole career, and that is the evolution uh, of firms uh, and struggling with this notion of why is it that successful firms frequently stumble at either technological transitions or environmental shocks like COVID. The reason that has been like stuck with me for all these years, uh, Boris, is I started my career as an electrical engineer. I was a co-op student at Northeastern and I work study program and I had a great job at a company called Genrad. And while I was there, a firm filled with great engineers and the number one test equipment company at that time on the planet, I saw it fail. I could not understand how a firm filled with great engineers and the number one firm in the industry with all the assets and all the knowledge to make this next transition, how could it fail? My carpool friends, I went back and forth to work to West Concord, Massachusetts with a bunch of engineers and they were all getting laid off. And I said to myself, how could this possibly be? That burning issue of seeing my friends without a job and yet their firm was the best and they were the best have sort of propelled this research on technology, innovation, senior teams and change. And now with winning through innovation, um, lead and disrupt and now corporate explorer, I think I can now have a conversation with my carpool friends. I can actually talk to them of what the heck happened so long ago. That's that's great. That's great, and and, and uh, interesting to understand that that background. And then many people feel that existing corporations might not be the best vehicle to explore these these new businesses. That it's actually better for companies to do this in a way of spinning out organizations, just creating new businesses from scratch, and, or they can always be. Uh, acquisition targets, right? They can acquire yes. these innovative organizations. Yeah. Well, why do you argue that existing companies not only can, but actually should explore new territory? Yeah, so in terms of the latter question, uh, Boris, why they should is it's not the role of the leaders at General Radio to close down 2,000 people and say goodbye. That's not their job. It's not the job of the leadership team at Xerox to say goodbye to thousands of people. That's not their job. Their job is what I think about as dynamic capabilities, is creating organizations that can reinvent themselves proactively. We're doing a piece of work now uh, at Deloitte. The extent to which consulting is changing right now, yes. that's the job of Deloitte senior leaders, is to create their organizations that can succeed over time and not lay off thousands of consultants. So that's why, is that they have the assets, they have the capabilities, they have the knowledge. Why not? So that's, that's the driving question behind this is, that is the role of my students. I happen to be, for the past bunch of years, in both AMP and PLD. That is the job of senior leaders is to do that. I'm sorry, I lost what, what the prior question was, Bars. Oh, yeah, it, it was what, in terms of uh, should, should there be an opportunity for these businesses yeah. to create? And you're saying yes, but then... Oh, yeah. well, is, is it better to do so yeah. or is it better to buy these businesses? Yeah, yeah, is it yeah. better yeah. to let them run, out, run free and, hey, yeah. we, we've created this, let's spin it out. Why, why yeah. keep it? Yeah, yeah, great. So I've had an ongoing debate with a bunch of my colleagues in the field and at HBS. So most classically, my debate with Clay Christensen was, Clay's point of view was spin outs. And... Uh, my point of view is no, not spin-ups. If there's anything to leverage between the exploratory piece of the business and the core business, the last thing you wanna do is spin it out. You wanna figure out a way to simultaneously explore and exploit simultaneously. So that that's, yes, you can do it through alliances. Yes, you can do it through joint ventures. Yes, you can do it through acquisition. But if you get this ambidexterity right, it's way more efficient to do it organically. That's if you can get it right. Now, now it's not right. that you never partner, it's not that you never uh, uh, acquire, it's just that the default should not be that. It should be, hey, do we have the assets to do it organically? Understood, understood. And then if, uh, there's actually a question that just came in from Anil Mehishwari, who is asking about organizational ambidexterity that you just mentioned, and then individual ambidexterity. 
what 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 is, what are some of the differences? Is is individual ambidextrity necessary for organizational capabilities, or are, do you think these are independent processes? Yeah, well, it's a super question. Um, organizational ambidexterity. Let me just get it out there. Uh, in in lead and disrupt my new book with Charles O'Reilly, second edition, and with Corporate Explorer with Andy Benz, myself and Charles, we have this notion of structural ambidexterity. And what we mean by structural ambidexterity, everybody, is you split exploit from explore. One of the core ideas of my field, and this comes from Jim March, a distinguished organizational sociologist at Stanford, is dynamic capabilities, the firm level, is rooted in doing what you're currently doing well, better than anybody in the planet. We call that, he called that exploit and exploring into an uncertain future. The architectures required to exploit are fundamentally different and inconsistent with explore. So we have this notion of structural ambidexterity where you split explore from exploit, you leverage think capabilities that are common like at HBS, we have HBX, which is separate from HBS, but we leverage faculty research. So if there's a brand leverage, there's capability leverage, there's financial leverage, we, we want to build in leverage in the system. That's what we call strategic linking and senior team integration. That's what we mean by structural ambidexterity. Individual ambidexterity, um, I, I'm not particularly, that, that's not core to our ideas. I want to have a senior team who can handle paradox. And I guess I want the leader of that team to be able to think about and cogitate around paradox, but I'm less interested in individuals being ambidextrous than I am in organizations being ambidextrous. Mm. I'm not sure I'm answering your question on that at the individual level, but the core of our, of our ideas in corporate explorers are having people who have the courage to manage change from below along with senior teams, and it's the combination of them that have this explore and exploit mentality. Where we're really looking at the people and culture and the systems, right, the hardware and software, you're looking at all of it collectively being ambidextrous, right? And that's, it, it sounds like really yeah. they're, they're one and the same. Yeah, but here's, here's, here's the key that, that is we make a big deal in Lead and Disrupt and in the Corporate Explorer book. We're trying to build into organizations and we're trying to do that everybody at HBS. We're trying to build in massively inconsistent architectures, people, process, structure, and culture between HBX and HBS. We're trying to build massively separate organizational architectures. The ambidextrous leader is the Dean and the Dean's senior team. Yes. But everybody, what holds together these tensions what I don't want to have, Boris, is everyone exploring and exploiting. I actually don't. I want the exploiters to do the exploit. I want the explorers to do the explore. I want to come together with the senior team. But what holds that together is this issue of identity and passion. And I've been hammering that with my uh, research and with my students over the past three or four years, is what holds these ambidextrous organizations together is this passion around we create leaders who make a difference in the world. And the Dean, Shrikant, does not care whether we do that on campus right. or whether we do it online. But all I want to say is there's a tension in the school between the online crowd and the on-campus crowd. And that's the tension that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why this issue of identity and purpose is so important. That, that, that makes sense. And then in terms of how and by dexterity uh, is permeating your teachings, Mike, and the second edition of Lead and Disrupt versus Corporate Explorer, people are wondering in the chat, how, how is ambidextrity connected to the Corporate Explorer and the themes of that book? Yeah. And we're also curious to understand how are the two books connected and different? And I guess, how, how has your research evolved over time to it being now in the realm of Corporate Explorer? Yeah, uh, super, super great. The Lead and Disrupt book, everybody, was written from the senior team level of analysis. I believe, and that's sort of rooted in my, my like searing experience when all my couple friends lost their jobs, 
was I should be talking to the board at General Radio and the senior team at General Radio. And my unit of analysis for my first like 15, 20 years was the most senior levels of a firm in the board. What we have learned through the research and our practice with change logic is it's just not the senior team. You have to have people like Balaji Bondili, Carol Kovac, who were down, actually my PLDers and my AMPers, most of my PLDers and AMPers are corporate explorers. Mm -hmm. You cannot make this happen without senior team support. And I was sort of stuck there, but that's a necessary but not sufficient condition. So the book with uh, uh, Andy and Charles, The Corporate Explorer is much more around what it takes for the corporate explorer to take his or her entrepreneurial passion and build that in an incumbent organization. Because at the end of the day, what I'm personally interested in is the reinvention of incumbent firms. I'm, I'm, or if I'm an entrepreneurial firm, pivoting to scale. So some of you know the Lululemon case. I, I'm not interested in starting up Lululemon. I'm interested in Lululemon going to scale. Yeah. And again, those of you who are entrepreneurs, you explore on average better than you exploit. And the pivot for entrepreneurial firms is going to scale, which is an exploit move. Those of you incumbent firms, you over exploit and under explore. So both are important, but the energy of my book with Corporate Explorer is several levels down. It's with Carol Kovac at IBM. It's Balaji Bandili at Deloitte, who are relatively low level managers but they're, they're entrepreneurs in a corporate context. Got it, got it. That makes sense. And it's effectively permeating different levels of their organization and that passion and ambition and how can it be channeled even more impactfully. Anthony, I know that you had some questions about the yeah. Corporate Explorer book. Yeah, I was going to say, thanks, thanks, Mike. And hello, everyone from, from around the world. Um, the, the, it's interesting that you say this. So the actual subtitle from the book is like, how did corporation, how corporations beat startups at the innovation game? Right, so you mentioned a few examples, but maybe go go a little bit more in depth in, in a few of them because to me that kind of sounds counterintuitive, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, say again, Anthony, the counterintuitive in, in what sense from your perspective? Like why would corporations beat startups at the innovation gate? Yeah, 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 yeah. What are some more examples? You briefly yeah. mentioned Lloyd yeah. and, and a few so others. So why they should, in my view, is they have the assets. They certainly have the capital. They have the capabilities. They have all that is required to be entrepreneurial and to reinvent an industry. But what we talk about, and this is what Mike Beard talked about, is silent killers in the organization, this inertia in the organization, almost always kill these entrepreneurs. And so what we've written about in the Corporate Explorer is what they can do bottom up through the social movement and top down to make that happen. So I, 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 I think that, that this, this corporate explorer book is really written around this notion of, hey, incumbent firms simply cannot do it. The Harvard Business School, and I, again, I'm, I'm sort of living it. The Harvard Business School cannot innovate. No, okay. the act, actually, Harvard Business School should be the leader in reinventing MBA and executive education. And that's what corporate explorer is all about. It's not so much HPS, but it's around all incumbent firms unleashing their capabilities. Yeah, so I'd love to check, like, so from what you're saying, there's the corporate explorer, which is the individual at the level, and then there's a C-suite. So to first speak about the corporate explorer, and I'm sure, like you said, there's, a, a, like, a lot of them on the call today, right? And, and you see the questions coming, like, what would, why would they take on that incredibly hard task, like you said, yeah. of building a new venture inside the corporation rather right. than just right. leaving totally. and, and going from totally. the other side? Yeah, totally. Uh, I don't know, but the corporate explorers that I know that have been successful kind of have a passion to transform their industry. And they think, hey, if I can transform advertising through Havas, if I can transform consulting through Deloitte, doesn't that give me an edge rather than trying to transform consulting, you know, through Pixel? So the, the aspiration of these corporate explorers is pretty bold. And they say, hey, wait a minute, I can leverage, if I can leverage the capabilities of Havas, if I'm doing, you know, I, by the way, I can talk about Havas because we have a case on it. Uh, if I can leverage the capabilities of Havas to transform, um, this is what John Windsor wanted to do, to transform advertising, hey, that's great. 
I just don't want the John Windsors to be surprised about the difficulty of doing it in incumbent organizations. Entrepreneurs have their own difficulties. Corporate explorers have their unique difficulties being in a corporate context. And that's what we talk about in corporate explorers. Absolutely. So what would you recommend an aspiring corporate explorer to, to do, right? Like to, to get on that journey. They've made the decision that they want to do it from inside rather than outside. How would they go about that? Yeah. So we make a big deal in corporate explorers about this creating a social movement. I can tell you what I don't want you to do. That's fair. What I don't want you to do is say, like, I'm the hero. I'm coming in to reinvent corporation X, Y, or Z. The antibodies will kill you fast. What I do want you to do is, first of all, make sure you have senior leader support. Make sure at Deloitte, one of the reasons why it works so well at Deloitte, at least so far, is Balaji had support from his boss and his boss's boss, Peter Giorgio and uh, Matt David. And they had support from the senior levels of Deloitte around, hey, we've got to transform consulting before McKinsey or before any of the other large consulting firms. Yeah. So one is I want to have senior team support. Two, I want to have a point of view. Like Balaji had a point of view of the crowd. They yeah. said we can leverage the crowd. Hey, wow, that can really help modularize the consulting project. And we're going to outsource talent to the crowd. Hey, that's a neat idea. Let me try that inside um, uh, Deloitte. And now I want to create a social movement quietly. One of the reasons these strategic leadership forums work so well uh, at IBM under the Parmesano era mm -hmm. is that Bruce Harold and Sam Parmesano created these experiments quietly. And once you have these SLFs working or once Pixel works with a couple of clients and a couple of projects, and then it goes to another piece of Deloitte and then it goes to another piece of Deloitte, it catches on fire. So this notion of creating a social movement, and those of you who know Julie Badalana's work on power and influence or um, uh, Julie Badalano with Tiziana Cacharo. Those of you at Toronto know Tiziana Cacharo. There right. were and actually Professor Batilano was with us in uh, in October and November, Mike, yeah. with our club and other partner clubs who joined. Well, Julie's work with Tiziana on social networks and power and influence. That is partly what corporate entrepreneurs have to do. They have to create a social movement bottom up, along with top down. Mm -hmm. that, oh, that's... and one the one other one other, one other <laughs> yeah. thing. It, one other thing is that don't be put in a position, if you're an explorer, don't get caught in this matrix trap. What do you I think in order for exploratory endeavors to work, they need to be separate from the exploit organization. And I don't want them to be merged into the exploit organization until they're big enough, they're successful enough, and they have a business model work, and they have legitimacy, then you bring it in. Mm. So that's other advice that we have in the corporate explorers to maximize the probability you're successful in the firm. Yeah, that, that, thanks for the explanation. Like I, I see a few questions as well from Tom and Juan, um, kind of around the same theme. We've talked a lot about the corporate explorer, which is the, st the staff, for lack of a better word, but everyone's kind of saying, well, what does senior leadership say, right? Like it, it's very much dependent on them. So the, the question I have, and I'll, I'll paraphrase Juan and Tom's as well, is saying like, is there anything special about the leadership in these organizations like Deloitte or I know in the book, there was yeah. one about insurance, which someone mentioned yeah. as well in the you comments. Know. They yeah. work for insurance. Like what about that leadership? What were their traits or did they do anything particular like performance evaluation or anything like that, that, that allowed them to be, allow the corporate explorers to be successful? Super question, super question, uh, Anthony. Uh, what we have found both from a research perspective uh, in my field and from a cons cons consulting perspective. This is the most important part, is mm -hmm. getting senior teams that can be open to and embrace contradiction. Senior teams that can live with paradox. Senior teams that can be consistently inconsistent. My experience with senior leaders is they talk a good game, they don't live a good game. They talk ambidexterity, but live either exploit or explore. So one is having senior teams led by this ambidextrous leader 
who can embrace contradiction and who can live into contradiction. What helps that happen is senior teams that bolt to their strategy. And my experience with senior leaders is they're super good on strategy, but can bolt to that strategy, this notion of identity and passion, because you cannot do, so we're gonna have a Microsoft, uh, Nadella is gonna be talking to the Harvard business community later on today. One of the reasons he's able to pull off this transformation at Microsoft is to get this bold passion at the top of Microsoft. One of the things that makes it possible for ambidextrous organizations to survive is they have leaders who are not afraid of passion. Like I, I've talked a bunch about Cindy Fenwick uh, uh, at Children's Hospital. Those of you PLDs might remember that in PLD, we had a whole bunch of physicians from Children's Hospital. When I was talking about strategy, the first thing out of their mouths was until every child was well. I said, what, what are you talking about until every child is well? So, oh yeah, we have a leader, Sandy Fenwick, that's the first thing out of her mouth. She doesn't talk about waiting time in, in you know, the emergency room. She doesn't talk about the number of articles her researchers produce. She doesn't talk about cardiovascular disease. She talks about, at the end of the day, Children's Hospital is about until every child is well. A kid comes into our hospital and we come together for that kid. So one of the final things on senior teams, and I make a big deal with my students these days, Anthony, mm -hmm is you must embrace passion. You must embrace identity. And once you have a leader who says, we're here to create leaders who make a difference in the world. Hey, we can do that online and we can do that on campus. That passion, that identity permits contradiction and paradox to coexist. Thank you. Thanks for answering the, the question. Boris, did you uh, did you want to speak more about the silent killers? I know, Mike, you had, you had briefly mentioned it, but I think it's worth worth explaining a little bit more. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Anthony. Mike, were, were you talking about don't go waving the flag? You know, when I'm making change, all the arrows, right, or the arbalets are are at you, and you're talking about making sure that it's it's separate teams. Anything else that when people are not thoughtful about what they should be doing to advance corporate exploring? Anything else that's as Anthony said, it might be a silent killer. They don't even know it, but it's going to prevent them from creating these innovations. Yeah. So everybody in successful organizations. So we have this project, uh, this research done at Unica, a really successful insurance company at uh, Analog Devices, uh, really successful semiconductor company. Successful organizations, particularly if if you get large and old, build in gigantic amounts of inertia. That's sort of the pomposity associated with being the great Harvard Business School or the great you know, analog devices or the great Novartis. I wanna really be clear, this inertia, which is a silent killer of exploration is really important for the exploit part of the organization. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that great organizations are great is they have a people, process, structure, and culture that executes that strategy really well. And that is great for exploit. <laughs> it turns out it's a disaster for exploit. That's why we're so strong on getting the exploratory, the corporate explorers separated up. And I need the explorers. I need the Balaji Bundilis. I need the Carol Kovacs to say, hey, I get why we're so great at Deloitte, but we have a different point of view when we're gonna experiment, we're gonna experiment with new clients, we're gonna experiment with new ways, we're gonna have a few partners say, hey, wow, I'm gonna give this a try. And then a few other partners give it a try. And suddenly the incumbent organization codes the exploratory stuff, not as a threat, but as an opportunity. As soon as the corporate explorers can break through the threat coding challenge. And again, incumbent organizations, if they code the explorer as a threat, like we did this great piece of work, one of my students, Hila Lipschitz, did a great piece of research at NASA on open innovation at NASA. This is gonna get super resisted by the scientists at NASA, as you might recall, those of you that have me as a faculty member. 
But as soon as Jeff Davis, hey, wait a minute, we're here to keep astronauts safe in space. That's why we're here. We're not here to do heliophysics research. We're here to keep astronauts safe in space. As soon as they went from that threat coding to, wow, this helps me do my work better, then this corporate explorer is like, th th then the um, inertia, these silent killers can go away. There are good reasons why firms should be inertial. For every 100 corporate explorers, you know, 90 are fools, everybody. And that's why silent killers exist, to mm -hmm. get them out. So you want to be able to ideate, incubate, and scale. And this incubation is where you're testing. And at, at Deloitte, they must have 40 different experiments. And at the senior leadership level, they know of these 40 experiments, a whole bunch of them are going to fail. Pixel didn't. So again, this inertia is really silent killers have a functional force in organizations because oftentimes these exploratory ideas are really wacky. But the future is in there. And that's where I, that's where I want the corporate explorers to create these experiments, to have small wins, and then things begin to take off. You, what are your thoughts they, they said on the actual like corporate accelerators, incubators, and, and that like the more formal aspect of, of corporate? Yeah, no, I, I, I love accelerators. I love formal. Uh, I, I love all the formal things that firms do to explore. All the formal things that firms do to incubate. That's fantastic. But, and I think that's easy to do, everybody. What's hard to do, and that's why we make such a big deal of it in the Corporate Explorer book. Let me say it differently. I think ideation is pretty straightforward. Good ideas. Incubation, experiment, totally straightforward. Going to scale is really hard. Going to scale is hard whether you bring it in through acquisition, alliance, joint venture or organically. And that's the point of Corporate Explorer is what we have learned about going to scale. So those of you out there who are corporate explorers, the challenge will be taking this idea in whatever organization you're in and going to scale, creating this social movement so that, this, so that you're actually able to demonstrate, hey, wow, this is a complementary line of business. It's not gonna substitute for the core. Much like at HBS, once, once the faculty and the staff learn that the Harvard Business Analytics Program, I think there are HBAP participants here, once they learn that HBAP is not a substitute but a complement to the MBA program and executive education, oh my God, that's pretty fantastic. That's great, that's great. And you've referenced the biological systems and antibodies, whether they recognize something to be a virus or something to be use, useful and helpful to the body. In terms of how this relates to startup or startups or how this is different, better, worse, what are some of the challenges that corporate explorers are facing that their colleagues at startups aren't? And how, how, do, they also, uh, yeah. how do they also overcome or mitigate for that? Yeah, so the, the, the challenges that corporate explorers face is that prior pasture we were in, on the silent killers. This, by the way, the silent killers come from, that idea comes from Mike Beer, a dear friend and colleague uh, at HBS, who is a whole piece of work on the silent killers. The, the issue that corporate entrepreneurs face are the silent killers, the people, the capability, not the people, the capabilities and the culture. And someone mentioned earlier, uh, the incentives that are all focused on getting today's work done today. And what the corporate explorer has to do is say, hey, different set of incentives, a different kind of culture, a different set of capabilities, as we have a strategy to reinvent, whether it's advertising, whether it's media, uh, whether it's research at NASA, or whether it's executive education at HBS. So it's those silent killers, it's which an entrepreneur in his or her own firm don't have those silent killers. They have to work on the capital markets to get funding but they don't have these silent killers where it's just the reverse in the corporate entrepreneur. They have a lot of funding, they have potential for funding, but they have all these silent killers. Got it, got it. And then in terms of, we've compared this to startups, early stage businesses. What about manufacturing firms versus service-based economy? Timothy, Timothy Schneider is saying, is 
ambidextrity more attuned with manufacturing businesses? Uh, are uh, service-based businesses able to implement it as well? Yeah, hey, super question. Um, the reason I did these Havas, the Havas case, my most recent cases are Havas, the global advertising agency, the, the advertising pizza Havas, uh, and now most recently this Deloitte case, which was to explore, to research and investigate do the ideas of ambidexterity, which were rooted in technology-based product firms, like analog devices, like IBM, would that apply in pure service plays? And the answer is absolutely yes. And by the way, the same, same thing with HPS, which we are a ser pure service play. Uh, so those of you who are in service settings, um, we, we did a, a case on the Denver Public Schools a not-for-profit example of ambidexterity in public education. So yeah, the short answer is those of you who are in service organizations or even not-for-profit organizations, um, this notion of structural ambidexterity, contradiction, identity, passion, ideate, incubate, and scale are equally important. And those of you from around the world, <laughs> um, this is like a total global thing. It's not unique to the wacky United States. One of the questions here is uh, coming from folks uh, like Adige and Juan is in terms of how are leaders dealing, Mike, with the ambidextrity, with corporate exploring, how can they most encourage with performance management, KPIs, incentives, how can they most encourage this behavior? How can they build it into the system? Yeah, great, great. So this issue of incentives always comes up. Mm. What it requires is that the uh, ambidextrous leader, that he or she must build a completely different incentive scheme for Balaji Bandili in Pixel at Deloitte than for the traditional consulting piece of Deloitte. So this whole notion of measures and metrics and scorecards have to be completely different from the explore versus exploit. Explore incentives tend to be more long-term, tend to be more subjective, tend to be more like, is there buzz in the, in the industry, in the community? Where mm -hmm. the exploit measures are, you know, they're day-to-day -day profit measures much more certain measures. So this notion of KPIs, performance measures, incentives are really important and leaders need to be able to be comfortable with having inconsistent set of incentives and metrics and scorecards. At the senior team level, yes. what we have found is senior teams must have a common fate incentive. If you have a senior team, that in the senior team is the exploit set of managers and the explore, the corporate explorers, there needs to be a common fate incentive so that everybody benefits from the reinvention of HBS or the reinvention of Deloitte or the reinvention of Havas. So this, this notion of incentives, both at the explore exploit units, consistent, but at the team level, we need to have common fate incentives so that we're all in it so we can be the world's greatest whatever. So we can live into uh, uh, until every child is well. And again, until every child is well means the incentives are going to be inconsistent inside that organization. But we're, we're building these inconsistent incentives to live into that overarching identity. Understood. And then there's incentives that are there uh, over time in the structures facilitating the activities that are being encouraged of all in the organization. What uh, are the leaders needing to do, Mike, actively to motivate their teams, to inspire the passion, in addition to setting, setting the kind of vision and setting the goals, which uh, yeah. again is, is, is very impactful, passive. Uh, what, is, what could be some of the very active activities that leaders yeah. would have to do on an ongoing basis to push yeah. it forward? Yeah. The most important role for ambidextrous leaders and corporate explorers, that, that sort of 
constellation of executives is to be out there every day walking the talk, to be out there every day singing a song that is consistently inconsistent. So I, and I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. The extent to which the leader and his or her team are not out there explaining, creating a narrative around why we're both doing online work and on campus work, why we're doing research with the crowd and we're doing research at NASA. Leaders have to be out there creating a narrative, this identity stuff and a narrative associated with that to, so people can understand why the heck are we acting in this sort of ambidextrous, inconsistent way. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The second big thing, which we, ha we really haven't talked about yet, is the corporate explorer and the ambidextrous leader changing members of the senior team. One of the reasons why NL has been super successful in becoming a green organization in the power distribution and development world, one of the reasons why NL has been so successful in that is the vast majority of the senior leaders are different. This fellow Starachi comes in and there's an awful lot of new leaders who have this green mentality at NL. So frequently executive succession, you got to build new teams that, so that we're all in line with this aspiration of green energy at NL. So one of the other levers is, is changing the senior team. There's just so much a corporate explorer can do on that end. That's why this, 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 it has to be a top down and bottom up. And frequently the top in these organizations has to change or said differently. One of the reasons why this thing did not work at Havas, though some of you know the Havas case, is that David Jones didn't take out some of his senior leaders who were totally comfortable with the old way of doing advertising. So one of the pieces of this recipe is executive succession. That, that makes sense. Anthony, I know you had some questions about the, the guts of the innovation inside the business. Yeah, like we, we, we definitely touched like about a, like a, a lot of things and you mentioned a lot of terms, but like one thing that stuck out, you had mentioned ideation, incubation, and, and what was it? Scaling. Yeah, scaling. You touched upon, but maybe flush that out a little bit more. And, and when obviously it's easy to succeed, you can paint that picture, but when would they potentially fail, right? Like what would be some reasons? Yeah. So ideation to me is this notion of we create a bunch of ideas to live into this aspiration. Incubation is this notion of generating exper experiments. And so some of you know, remember Stefan Tunke, his notion is you fail forward, is creating in the firm a whole bunch of experiments. Now, whether these experiments are done organically um, Anthony, or whether you're experimenting through alliances, joint ventures, contract research, you have these incubators. I'm, I'm completely indifferent about that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the incubation part. And, I get, and again, we've learned a lot about that over the past 15 years. Yeah. The issue that we spend most of the time in Corporate Explorer, at least in my head, yeah. um, and we didn't spend that much time in Lead and Disrupt, is going to scale power politics cliques coalitions social movements and going to scale that's that's the key is at least in our work is hey once you've done all this incubation at, at deloitte once you have all these experiments that are that are legitimate because we're going to try to recreate consulting of 100 experiments you got to choose a few to go to scale and by the way you can't choose all of them because you <laughs> go bankrupt but yeah. which are the ones you choose and then have the political savvy to create the social movement so that some of them actually become successful and don't get killed by the silent inertia stuff we talked about, the silent killer stuff we talked about earlier. And do you find, this is somewhat off topic, but it just came to mind, like being that we're on Zoom now and, and that like, if you're like, if you have a version two of the book, like how does the virtual workplace versus kind of an in-person workplace potentially impact that? Yeah. Like, so, um, in that. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's a super question. I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. I do, the, I do know that my colleague Sadal Neely has doing a bunch of work on exactly that, is how you actually engage an organization, most of which is being done online um, yeah. or on Zoom. I don't have a good answer. I cannot answer that competently, except, exactly. except to say that's an important question. <laughs> yeah, so then based on that, like, I guess, being there are decisions to be made do you go back to the office do you remain virtual and not like being a with the hat of an of an of a leader right how do they decide which of these new ventures should be inside or outside right because you said 90 percent of them are are quacks right or like they need to be and like they need to be silently killed like how do you use how do you use that or, or do you argue that they all should be inside and silently killed inside or should some be actually done outside? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of this, this notion of scaling past that we talk about in the corporate explorer. This, this notion of do you invest internally or do you acquire? Do you? Exactly. That, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of indifferent about that, Anthony. Um, I, I do know that if we have the capabilities inside, I want to leverage it inside. I don't want to have to go out when we have it inside. But if there are core capabilities for our reinvention, I, some of you know I did some work on the Ball Corporation. If, if we're going to move containment from glass to plastic, and I don't have plastic capabilities, I got to acquire it. Yeah. And so I'm not, it's not that everything's going to be done organically, but the extent to which we have capabilities inside HBS to do online digital this distribution of content and research, mm -hmm. let's do it internally. And by the way, maybe sometimes we'll partner with 2U. And maybe we're going to learn from that. So, so I'm sort of okay with either one. I just don't want to squander assets that we have internally. That's why this ambidexterity is high differentiation. Targeted integration with the stuff to leverage and strong senior teams. And the leverage, the leverage can be done. If it's done internally, you can save a lot of money because acquiring it in joint venture, you pay a premium for that. Yeah, very much so. So you and so if, if back to then the the corporate explore the the corporate explorer for them to succeed, you had, you had written about in the book like the scaling path, and you've kind of maybe seen a commonality. You can touch upon that uh, on the scaling path. No, I actually don't don't. I'm not sure we see a commonality on the scaling path, except that what is common about that is that that the corporate explorer and the organ and the leaders to whom he or she report are thinking explicitly about what are we doing internally? What are we gonna do externally? How do we test in the marketplace? How do we get ideas from our clients? And then how do we spread those ideas in the system? So I, it's, it's, we've learned about, these are the different steps in doing that. Yeah. What, what it really it takes to go to scale is this sort of social movement stuff. Again, this top down, bottom up stuff that we've been talking about earlier. Yeah, so th there's been a lot of questions or comments, just kind of, you can't see them, or, but confirming what you're saying about the top-down approach, but there needs to be diversity and, you know, different cultures and, you know, I imagine different ideas. So a lot of people are, that's resonating, um, that comment especially, um, uh -huh, right. and having different and uh, divergent opinions. Yeah, and that's what's really key, both in the senior team and creating in the organization, in the senior team being able to host like different worlds, completely different strategies and contradictory strategies, particularly if you're gonna reinvent. But that diversity has to be deep into the organization. And that's what we mean by structural and by dexterity is some part of the organizations look completely different than others and you need to have a narrative as to why we're doing that. Again, in HBS, why the heck are we doing HBX? And why is it like a couple of miles away? There needs to be a narrative. That's, oh yeah, partly our agenda is to create leaders who make a difference in the world and that's gonna change over time. But we're building that throughout the system and dealing with the tensions associated with that. Okay. Of course, there's about five minutes left. Uh, you want to add yes, and we, and we have some, some great questions coming in too. Mike, one, one of the, themes that's coming up in several people's questions. Adolfo Perez Duran is one of 
the people asking, and there's several who are talking about, it's difficult for a leader to hold two disparate ideas, to be thinking of both exploring and exploiting, and then also not be uh, threatened and not be concerned and, and actually deal with, wow, this may be this brand that's making a lot of public noise. And then there's our consistent exploiting, making money business. Just how does a, an individual who's the CEO come to be able to deal with those two worlds? Yeah. Um, I'm just writing myself a note on that. Yeah. So somebody asked earlier about individual level ambidexterity. That's right. So I think the corporate explorers are not particularly ambidextrous. The biologists of the world, the Carol Kovac, like Carol, like building life sciences. She's not ambidextrous. Biology is doing pixel. He's not ambidextrous. But the leaders to whom they report have to be. Because we're going to transform IBM. We're going to transform Deloitte. We did this work a while ago at SEBA's Crop Protection Division. They had this gigantic business on herbicides and fungicides, and it was a gigantic business out of Basel. But the leader of this organization knew the future of crop protection is not chemicals, it was molecular biology. So we had this ambidextrous organization thousands of miles away, staffed with molecular biologists to create seeds who don't need herbicides, fungicides, or insecticides. Those leaders need to have in their head this notion of, hey, I have to win for today and I have to create for tomorrow. And one of the, one of the things they can do to help make them more passionate about it in their teams is what made that organization so special is we're here to keep crops healthy, so, something like that. And if you're Wolfgang Samo, you don't care how you keep crops healthy. Could be chemistry, it could be biology. That's why this notion of identity, this meta level passion of keeping crops healthy or healthy eyes for life or leaders who make a difference in the world or until every child as well, that gives me as an individual the ability to talk in paradoxical ways. And when someone says, hey, Wolfgang Samo, you're being inconsistent funding molecular biologists and chemists. You say, yeah, I am being inconsistent. Hmm. But this is how it makes sense, right? I'm, I'm building for today and I'm creating tomorrow. And it makes sense because I have this passion around until every child as well. We must, when this kid comes in right now, we, we're all over that kid. Even as we do the research so that the kid doesn't come in the future because we've done this like basic research at children's hospital. Mm -hmm. That's why this identity, this passion thing, it takes it beyond numbers and strategy to why do we exist as an organization? And allows to connect those disparate worlds. And, and, it, and, and allows these senior leaders to connect those disparate worlds and allow these corporate explorers to exist. Because the reason they exist is to help the organization be invented. So, and this is back to uh, my point, that Syrian experience when I was a double E. Had this firm done that back then, they would still be there in West Concord. But they didn't have the corporate explorer to help them get to the future. Or if they did, these silent killers killed them. That's, that's tremendous, uh, Mike. And we are at the hour. And I think what you've shared just now is, is, a, is a great capstone for people to take away and think about together with the structures, systems, culture and energy and passion that you've talked about throughout our session. Yeah, there's one thing I wanna leave you with everybody is the structure is simple. The targeted linkage is, is, is simple, mm. but this passion identity for the firm, not so simple. And this notion of social movements, this power in politics, cliques and coalitions to take an idea and quietly test it out and quietly, oh, wow, this works and quietly gain the legitimacy. And once that happens, it catches on fire. And all of a sudden these corporate explorers are like, wow, we've helped transform companies X, Y, and Z. And that's what corporate explorer is all about. That's awesome. Th thank you very much, Mike, on behalf of the clubs, all the fellow clubs that have joined in the session, the attendees, Anthony and myself for sharing 
your learning share and your knowledge. And we're very excited about Corporate Explore, the book that just launched yesterday. So what we'll yes. be doing is we'll be sending up, uh, sending a follow-up email to all the people who've attended about the book itself. And then also Corporate Explorers Club that you and Andy Bins have generously shared yes. to people who have joined so that they can explore additional materials, video lectures, et cetera, that are on the Corporate Explorers website. Yeah, the whole idea of this Corporate Explorer uh, community is building a community to figure out how to do this. That is the idea of this sort of community social movement that we can share expertise uh, in the community. So that's, yes, thank you for that uh, uh, shout out for us. Pleasure, great. And I've enjoyed these, these lectures and I look forward to our attendees uh, joining into this community as well, Mike. Great, thank you everybody for joining. And thank you for thank your you great Mike. question. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.